experiences its most successful system of government, democracy, and enjoys an intellectual and cultural blossoming that is unsurpassed. The city has become the school of Hellas. Following the victory at Marathon in 490 BC, the city began to build on the Acropolis a great temple for Athena, known today as the Pre-Parthenon. Over its foundations was to rise the new temple of Athena, the Parthenon itself. The architects were Ictinus and Callicrates. The building was finished in only nine years, between 447 and 438 BC, under the general supervision of the famous sculptor Phidias. Six years after the completion of the temple, the sculpture too was finished. The Parthenon is unique because of its proportions, its superb construction, the richness and quality of its sculpture, and also because of its brilliant setting on the top of the sacred rock. It's a Doric temple with many ionic features. It's surrounded by a peristyle, a colonnade on each of the four sides. It is octostyle as it has eight columns across both the narrow ends. Along each of its long sides, there are 17 columns. The central, closed part of the temple is called the cella. It was divided into two compartments, the east and the west, which did not communicate with each other. The great gold and ivory, chryselephantine statue of the goddess Athena was housed in the east compartment. This famous work by the sculptor Phidias stood at a height of some 13 meters and was considered a masterpiece in antiquity. A two-tiered Doric colonnade enframed the statue and supported the roof beams. In the west compartment, four very tall ionic columns served the same purpose. The cella had, in addition, a second row of six Doric columns, east and west, forming a portico at each end. The entrance to the temple was at the east. The Parthenon is the culmination of a long course of development in the Doric order, which began at least 250 years earlier. It is built of white pandelic marble. The precision with which the marble was worked is astonishing. It comprises around 16,500 pieces that join with each other perfectly. Yet, most impressive of all is the invisible deviation from strict geometric form, the famous optical refinements. The lines of the crepes and of the entablature curve slightly upwards rather than being straight. The shafts of the columns, too, have a slight convex curve as they taper upwards, which is greater at two-fifths of their height. The corner columns of each side are a little wider than the rest. All the columns have a small inclination toward the cella. These and other deviations from strict symmetry and uniformity serve to imbue the building with a pulse of life. The richness of the sculptural decoration of the Parthenon was unique. All the surfaces that could be decorated bore sculpture. 
there are three basic sculptural groups. The pediments, the frieze, and the metopes. The metopes are above the colonnades of the temple. They consist of square plaques decorated in relief and they alternate with the triglyphs. They are carved in such high relief that they are almost sculpture in the round. The subjects depicted were drawn from Greek mythology. On the east end were scenes from the battle between the Olympian gods and the giants. On the west was shown the fight between the Greeks and the Amazons, a mythical tribe of female warriors. The north side depicted events of the Trojan War and especially the fall of Troy. The south side mainly showed the fight between the centaurs and the lapiths. The centaurs, who had been invited to the wedding of the Thessalian king of the lapiths, became inebriated, and when they tried to carry off the lapith women, a hand-to-hand -hand battle ensued. Thus we find represented on most of the metopes the favorite theme of ancient Greek art, struggle. Here, the uncertain outcome of the struggle itself becomes a symbol of the perpetual conflict of opposing and antagonistic forces in nature, human society, and in the human soul. <laughs> The frieze encircled the outer side of the cella at a height of 12 meters above its base. It had a total length of 160 meters and was around a meter in height. It comprised 115 blocks with continuous representations in relief of men and animals in motion. The relief was exceedingly low, around six centimeters at most. The theme depicted was the procession to the Acropolis that took place during the Great Anathenaea, the festival in honor of the goddess Athena. The procession began in two lines from the southwest corner of the frieze and followed the long sides to meet at the east. In the composition of the frieze, the following groups can be distinguished. The preparation for the procession, the main procession itself, with ranks of horsemen and chariots. The procession bringing the offerings and sacrificial animals. And, finally, the culmination of the festival with the handing over of the peplos in the presence of the gods and goddesses in the center of the East End. Included in the composition were 378 figures, gods, heroes of the city, officials, citizens, men and women, children, youths and elders, and more than 220 animals, mainly horses, but cattle and rams as well. The faces of the figures resemble each other. They are serious and calm, imbued with ethos, spirituality, and pride. Great variety is evident in the poses of the figures, their movements and their dress. The horses of the procession are all shown in profile. Some walk quietly along, others run, some vie with each other. Head, mane, and tail give many of the horses distinct individuality. Rich colors and metal attachments once embellished the figures, which stood out in relief from a deep blue background. The pediments are the triangular areas formed by the sloping and horizontal cornices of the roof over the two narrow ends of the temple. Within these were the supreme sculptures of the Parthenon. The east pediment, above the entrance to the temple, depicts the birth of the goddess Athena. In the middle was the figure of Zeus, next to Athena and Hephaestus, who, according to the myth, split open the head of Zeus with an axe so that the goddess could be born. To the left is Dionysus reclining. Sitting beside him, Demeter and her daughter Persephone. Then standing, the goddess Artemis. 
In the right wing of the pediment is a group of three seated divinities, Hestia, Dion, and her lovely daughter Aphrodite. The scene is framed at each end of the pediment by the chariot of the rising Helios, the sun, and that of Selene, the setting moon, showing that the birth occurred at the dawn of day. In the west pediment was depicted the contest between Athena and Poseidon for claim to the Attic land. Athena won, and the city was named Athens. Shown in the middle are the two divinities with their gifts, Athena with her olive tree, and Poseidon with the salty water of the sea. Their chariots stand beside them. Behind, the two Olympian messengers, Iris and Hermes, arrive to proclaim the outcome of the contest. To the left, the mythical king Cecrops and his daughter watch the competition. Half-reclining figures in the two wings of the pediment establish the location with the personification of the river Cephasus and the Kaliroi Spring and the other Attic river, the Ilisos. These colossal statues were carved in the round with the same care for both the visible front and the invisible back of the figures, for as dedications to the gods, they had to be perfect. Since the building of the Parthenon, some 25 centuries have passed. The temple has endured many vicissitudes. The first major destruction probably occurred in 267 AD as a result of a fire. New perceptions on art, which predominated later on during the early Christian era, led to the destruction of many works of art throughout the Greek world, much of the sculpture of the Parthenon included. Centuries rolled by from that time without substantial changes to the temple. The Parthenon became the church of the Holy Virgin of Athens, the largest in the city. After 1205, it fell into the hands of the Franks of the Fourth Crusade and became a church of the Latin faith. In 1458, the Ottoman Turks seized Athens and transformed the great temple into a mosque. During the campaign of Francesco Morosini against Athens in 1687, a large section of the temple was destroyed in an explosion. From that time on until modern archaeological research began, the temple suffered systematic looting, especially by Lord Elgin, who, taking advantage of the conditions of the time, proceeded to violently remove and carry off much of the temple sculpture. Today, the Parthenon continues to dominate the modern city. To enhance an understanding of the temple, the Greek state is carrying out an innovative program of conservation and restoration of the monument itself, and has built a new museum especially designed for the exhibition of the Parthenon sculptures.